this is automatically the equivalent of using a proprietary program. But it's worse than that. Some proprietary programs are spyware and they, uh, they send data about the use of the machine to some server. Well, with software as a service, the user has to send the data to a server, which is the same result. So now that server has that data, and who knows what they're going to do with it. Uh, the police can probably get it. Uh, maybe they'll give it to the United States. Uh, and the United States would do who knows what. Uh, kidnap you and take you to Egypt to be tortured. So, uh, that's the same result as if you were, as if the user were using spyware, even though it's done without any special code to transmit the data to the server. But it's worse than that. Some proprietary programs have a universal backdoor that allows somebody else to change the software. With software as a service, the computing is done in the somebody's server, and the server operator, of course, can change the programs installed in the server. So, in, bo in both of these cases, somebody can change the way the user's computing is done without asking that person. So, software as a service is automatically the equivalent of running a proprietary program which is spyware and has a universal backdoor. So, for the sake of your control over your computing, reject software as a service. Fortunately, software as a service is rare. Most websites just publish information. That's not doing your computing. It's just making something available for you to look at. But let's consider the minority of websites that do some non-trivial service. Most of them are not doing your computing. Most of them are doing communication and publication and joint activities. Well, that's not your own computing, not yours personally. So that's not software as a service. The minority that offer to do your computing, those are software as a service. So those are the ones you should reject. For instance, Google Docs. Google Docs invites people to do word processing in a Google server instead of doing it in their own computers the way people have done it for a couple of decades. So don't use Google Docs. Use a free word processor and that way your word processing is not under someone else's control and power. There are other threats to our freedom from using some websites. When we give data to these sites, if we store our data in, our, in websites, they might misuse the data. Whether this is actually a danger in any given case depends on a lot of details. For instance, what data is it? Is it data that you want to publish? Well, if you're happy for everyone to know it, there's not much they can do is, except because if they use that data, they're just doing what you wanted everyone to do. On the other hand, if they alter it, that would be mistreatment, but maybe that would be very unlikely and you would notice. So I'm not saying all web services are bad, but this is an issue you need to think about. If the data is not meant to be published, might they give it to somebody that you didn't want them to give it to? 
if the data is important, might they lose it? Might they refuse to give it to you? So, these are things that can happen. The Bush regime uh, reportedly told a major ISP to destroy a lawyer's account and his data and not give it and lose it and so that they couldn't give it to him. And at first they told him that his account was gone due to a technical problem, but eventually they admitted to him that they had been told to lose it. There's a link on Stallman.org to that. So, if you, uh, so, so you've got to think about the question of whether you are willing to trust some service to store your data for you. The last threat I'm going to mention is the war on sharing the attempt to stop people from using the internet for the purpose it is best suited to, namely sharing information and sharing copies of works that are published. This is something that we want to do. When music is available digitally or videos or books, it's tremendously useful to share copies with other people. And we do this both through the internet and uh, locally using USB sticks and CDs. And there are companies that don't want to let us do this and are willing to go to any lengths and destroy anything whatsoever that happens to be in their path as they prosecute their war on copying. You can recognize their activities because they, they because of the propaganda terms they use. For instance, people who share, they call them pirates. They're trying to say helping other people, sharing with your friends, that's the moral equivalent of attacking ships. And this is twisted because attacking ships is very bad, but helping other people is good. Sharing is good. So we should refuse to call it piracy. We have to be on guard for their propaganda terminology because they have a lot of money and influence, these companies, so they can push their terminology into the mouths of lots of people and make their terminology look like the right way to talk about things. But we shouldn't follow them when what they're saying is bad. But if all they did was talk, we could ignore them. But they do a lot more. They have been imposing vicious laws around the world. For instance, there are the laws forbidding people to break digital handcuffs and banning the devices that can break digital handcuffs. For instance, there is free software that can play a DVD. DVDs are built with digital handcuffs. The video is often encrypted. And the purpose of this encryption is to restrict the users. That's why this is a system of digital handcuffs. Its purpose is to restrict people. And it worked because the format of the encryption was secret. But then some people figured out the format and released free software to do this.